And we're live. Episode, what, I think it's 46, the Takeaway Podcast, here with John Kenoy. Welcome to the show, brother. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Vince. Thank Happy to be here. Live from the basement. Live from yeah. the basement. I love it. I love it. Yep. So um, I'm sure a lot of the listeners are going to be familiar with who you are, but if you could maybe introduce yourself real quick for people that aren't familiar. Yep. So uh, I uh, grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's how I know Sam Vince. Mm-hmm. I went to uh, East County High School where my dad was a principal, which is uh, kind of <laughs> unique. And then uh, I played football and uh, then moved to uh, Western Michigan. I played at Western Michigan University for four years. Um, then last year I played with the Minnesota Vikings, um, mm-hmm. got cut, rejoined the practice squad. Um, they got cut again and then moved on to play for the XFLs, uh, Dallas Renegades. And then after that, I got picked up by uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers after this whole uh, virus mm-hmm. thing came to be. Yeah. So I guess uh, we'll just get right back to high school. Um, or, I, I mean, we could even go sooner than that. So you've been playing football like your whole life. At mm-hmm. what point did you realize that you were better than most people on the field, especially like in these <laughs> matchups? So I, I remember starting in third grade. Um, I knew I was always one of the heavier kids. Mm-hmm. Um, but our third grade team, I think we went undefeated. Or we lost one game our first year. We lost our first game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew I was pretty good. And uh, my dad, who had played in college, he was uh, he was always my coach growing up. So, like, mm-hmm. he was really good for my development. And then uh, – Fourth grade, I had to play a, a year up because I was too heavy. Um, really? In the league. Yeah, so I played That's a year crazy. up, which we didn't do very well, but I think it helped me kind of mature quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was always kind of like the bigger kid. I wasn't really that athletic until I kind of got to my junior year of high school or my sophomore year of high school, really. And uh, I started lifting weights and I started running more. I, I became more athletic. And I, um, my sophomore year, I became I started on varsity and uh, – I think that was the year I kind of knew that, like, if I wanted to play in college and I keep work, work, kept working how I was working, that, like, it could mm-hmm. be a possibility. Yeah. Did you always take it serious, like, right from the jump? Or was it just um, kind of like a hobby at the time? I always liked it. And, like, my parents always had it in my head that, like, um, if you're going to do something, you might as well just try to be the best at it. So, like, mm-hmm. um, whenever I played, I always tried to do my best and, and, and push myself to be the best player, like, either on the team or, or one of the top players on the team. So, like, from the jump, like, I had that mindset. So, I think that helped me um, as I moved up in my career. Okay. Oh, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, then, was it right – you said, like, junior year. Was it right around that time when you realized that most of the matchups, that you were just, like, overall a better player than most of the people you were going against? Yeah, because, like, my freshman year, I was kind of just like a roly-poly kind yeah. of type of dude. And uh, <laughs> I was just I was just beating people because I was bigger than them. But, like, mm-hmm. my sophomore – in my sophomore and really my junior year, I started noticing like um, what what the weight room was doing for me and how much stronger I was really getting. And like, I was able to dominate people more so than just being like bigger than them. So like, okay, um, yeah, I could see that difference on the field. And um, at, it was at that point like I started hearing from like college scouts and um, my dad and mom both told me that like this could be a real possibility of playing in college. Mm. Mm. So then, getting towards the end of high school. Um, you were a three-star recruit coming out of high school. Did you mm-hmm. feel as if you were underrated or did you feel that like that was right where you were supposed to be? Um, I mean, I, I figured I was be about a three-star. I, I'm never like, I was never like the fastest guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I was strong, but I wasn't the strongest guy. Um, and I, I committed before my senior year of, of like, so like in football, um, the summer has like a bunch of camps, college camps that you can go to and, Mm. Um, it gives coaches more of a chances chance to see you, but the camp circuit kind of sucks. So like I did it my sophomore year. I only did like two camps. My junior year, I did like 11 camps. Oh, dang. And then I hated, I, I hated the camps. And so like, what goes into I had, a camp? Like, what goes into that? So it's just yeah. like, it's kind of like a workout from like a college coach's perspective with like a bunch of prospects. There's probably like um, 50 linemen there that you work out with and you go like one-on-ones, um, you do different drills kind of, um, to show, it's kind of like a showcase. So you showcase your talents. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, at the end of my junior year, I had six offers, which were all like max wow. goals. Um, and it was the, I, it was that April I committed to play for, uh, Western Michigan. And it was cause like, I didn't want to go to that camp circuit again and try to get recruited <laughs> by a bigger school. And I knew it was a good fit for me. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was you, you mentioned it that your parents both went to Central. Mm-hmm. What made you choose like the direct rival over going to Central? <laughs> um, when I was being recruited, I like Central Michigan was my first offer okay. um, in high school. And uh, I, I didn't love the coaches there. I just knew it was like a, uh, my parents were both went there. So I gave them a shot like in recruiting, but they didn't recruit me as hard as I think Western Michigan did. And um, mm-hmm. at that time, like coach Fleck was the coach there and um, he was, he was a very good recruiter and uh, you know, they had a good offensive line coach. Um, they had potential. I mean, they were bad too. So like I knew <laughs> if I went there that I could possibly play mm-hmm. um, and it was close to home. So like that, that you know, was good for me. Yeah. Yeah. So then um Obviously, I, I didn't get to experience the whole recruit to college thing. So uh, <laughs> <Me either. laughs> recruiting, or I guess signing um, as a junior, is that uncommon then in the football scene? Um, I mean, you have people that commit to schools in like the, that time. And like um, a lot of times people commit early and they get bigger offers and they kind of um, they decommit, decommit and go, yeah. go somewhere else. But like when I was when I when I sat down with my parents, I told them like, hey, I'm uh, I want to go to Western Michigan. I like this is my choice. Like they fully supported it, and um, like I knew if I committed to them, I wasn't going to decommit and mm-hmm. uh, change my mind. So um, yeah. at that time, like it was just the right decision for me. Did you get uh, a bigger school your senior year at all? No. <laughs> so I I didn't go to any camps, and like all the like bigger schools in the state of Michigan wanted me to go to their camps, and like um, they said like if I went to their camp and did decent like I could I could get like an offer but like um for me it just wasn't worth it and like mm-hmm. I, I knew what I had in Western Michigan I knew what I had in Coach Fleck and um being able to spend time that summer with other recruits and helping like Western Michigan pick up more recruits it was uh it kind of became like a family there yeah 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 um I I remember that you went to Western early right like you finished high school semester early Cause you're a little genius and all that. And then you went, <laughs> and then you went, did you get the opportunity to like start practicing with the team sooner than you should have been able to? Yeah. So uh, I did, I graduated in the second semester or after the second semester of uh, my senior year. So I left in January and I missed the whole second half of my senior year, um, which I mean, it helped having my dad as a principal. So like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he was able to help me schedule what classes I needed and what credits I needed to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it definitely helped me because I was able to go to Western, uh, go through winter conditioning. Um, I was one of like three freshmen that did it. So like us three were able to build a good bond. Mm-hmm. Um, I was get, able to get like start lifting weights in like a college program, which is, is pretty beneficial. Um, yeah. And then I was able to go through spring ball, um, which there are oh, like wow. 15 practices in the spring, which are like super important for um, picking up the offense and, um, mm-hmm. just being able to find where you fit in the, in the whole scheme of things. Mm. So, so then, did you, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Vince, go ahead. Uh, so did you like, while you're at Western, were you also taking classes or were you just working out? Nope. Out? So my first, so January, I think 10th, I started at Western and I started taking a full semester worth of classes too. <sighs> like, I, and that, that helped me like in the long haul because I was able to graduate, I think in three and a half years. Mm. Um, but but because I had that uh, at first like half a semester was like oh true kind of kickstarted me. So what did you study while you were there though? Just um, so I wanted to go in something in business and I ended up choosing finance. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Numbers guy. Eh? Yeah, yep. Numbers guy. Yep. I like the numbers. <laughs> Not smart enough to be an accountant, but I like <laughs> I like the numbers. <laughs> So then you finally get, um, you know, freshman year starts, you're, you're playing football and all that. And then you win the freshman or not the freshman, you win the starter role pretty early on in your first season. Is that something, I mean, you kind of talked about it earlier, but is that something that you expected or was it kind of a surprise for you? So I knew I, I got to have a shot at it. Um, mm-hmm. I definitely going in early helped me because um, the, fir- as the first day of spring ball, I started as a second team center, um, okay. which was, which was a big, like, which was big for me. And then um, the first center on the first day had like three or four bad snaps. Mm. And so I got the next, the very next day, the second practice of my college career, I was a starting center, um, wow. which I can't say the practice went well, but I guess I did good enough to keep the job. So, yeah. Um, and then one thing I wanted to know is like, what's the jump from high school to college? Like you're going against, I mean, I, I remember seeing the high school football players walk around. They don't seem that big in high school. Yeah. 
like what's the difference like is it 50 pounds like is everyone just a lot bigger so i think i think people are more they start to mature when they get to college and um their bodies just they, they're just shaped differently like i like on the d like in the defense line in high school if you a good player would be about 250 pounds but like when you play good teams in college they're all 300 plus and they're all benching huge numbers and it's it's, it's the speed of the game of which things happen and how strong people are, which is a huge difference, I think. Yeah. Did you learn that the hard way? Like, was there a couple practices where you got flattened and then you had to realize that? I mean, I knew right away, like the second practice when I got thrown in there with the ones, mm-hmm. um, everything happened so quick. Cause like as a center, you make the calls, you like make the IDs. And I can remember a couple of times at practice, like I pointed at a guy and my left guard who was like a fifth year senior was like, John, that's not right. And he like paused the practice and said, John, that's who you got to ID. Mm. Um, so like, I mean, I had good guys around me to help me. Um, I had like a senior left guard and a junior right guard. So um, they were always good if I had any questions. And if I was messing up in practice, like they were there for me. That's good. Mm-hmm. Having that support right. system, man, that's the difference. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, how was your benching at that time? Were you like, I'm you <laughs> close? Were you like, yeah, I, I got some muscles on me too, y'all? <laughs> no. So like out of high school, coach, coach I, I, I left it with Coach Martins, like, almost throughout my high school career. And I was getting pretty strong. I was up to like 315. But like those guys were benching like 375, 380. And they were throwing it up with ease. So um, getting in the strength program early definitely helped me, I think, later on in my career. Mm -hmm. Did you get up to those numbers? Are you up to those numbers now? I'm So I got up to 375 my senior year, which is pretty good for bench. Um, Mm -hmm. That's really good. Pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, all right. right. I mean, compared to some guys at that level, it's, 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 it's okay. (laughs) <laughs> that's crazy that's but are crazy. some guys like clean though doing that you think so, or no <laughs> so like sometimes like you, you get some guys that are like super strong and super fast yeah. and they like they look freaking good in the weight room but then like yeah. when they get to the field they can't like it, it doesn't transfer over so sometimes mm. you get like a freak like strength wise and yeah. like, just can't carry over to the football field but you find that a lot more than you think mm. oh that's interesting. that's interesting yeah it's like yeah. athletics versus actual talent right yeah and so I, I wasn't the fastest guy I was always one of the slower guys I was always um I was like medium strength but I was able to carry whatever I had over to the field um better I don't know how or why but <laughs> it, it just it's just how it worked yeah so then um like we said you won you won the starting role really early how did uh how did your freshman year go like looking back were you comfortable um, was it a learning experience so my first game, we played the number four ranked Michigan State Spartans. <laughs> I mean, it, it went okay. Welcome like, to the league, John. <laughs> yeah, well, welcome to college football. You play yeah. the number four ranked fo- team. And yeah. uh, it was Malik McDowell who was their starting D tackle. He, I had a pretty rough game that game. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think as the season went on, I started to get better and better and started to feel more comfortable. Um, mm. There's but, a lot of it nerves. <clears throat> yeah, I'd say so. The first game, I was really nervous because, like, growing up, I was always a huge Michigan State Spartan fan. So, like, going from uh, high school and, like, growing up, going to, like, all of Michigan State stuff to my first game in college being against Michigan State. On their field, nuts. too. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. So, I, one thing I've always wanted <clears throat> to know is when you're one of these MAC schools and you go against, like, these high-tier Big Ten schools – is it – what's the conversation like in the locker room? Is it all about gaining experience, or are you guys actually, like, going out there to take a win? I mean, I think you always play to win. And, uh, right. like, especially when you play the bigger schools, like, your mindset is, like, if we do – if we win this game, like, it would be nuts. Like, people would talk about us. We'll be on Sports Center and, um, and that stuff. But I think our coaches in college were really good about um, putting that in our heads and, like, um, giving us a vision and a path of how – uh, to get it done and like if it ha- if if we win or like when we win like you guys will be like talked about all over the place so I, I mean it was always a cool challenge to go up against like the top schools yeah yeah are uh, are are people playing dirty in college <laughs> are like people like punching people in the ribs like like is it like you know when you're facing off for somebody is it like language being thrown I, it like, depends the- on the person most people, most guys are pretty cool. Like, you're pretty chill on the field. I mean, you always have, like, yeah. the one or two guys that, like, try to talk smack. But, like, after a couple of plays, like, they're too tired to talk any smack. At the <laughs> bottom of some piles, I'm sure there's some there's some, uh, some things that are being grabbed and pulled. But like, I've, only, I've only seen it a couple of times. Oh, okay. 
I was, I was just so annoyed at someone like, you know, poked me or something. I'm like, bro, like, I'm gonna break yeah. that finger. Or like <laughs> grabbing your face mask. That yeah. sucks. Yeah. So um, leading into the sophomore season, which is, you know, probably the most successful that we've seen Western up until this current point. Um, going into that season, we'll get into like what eventually happened into the season. But going in, did you guys expect to have the success that you eventually did? I mean, I, th- I like co- the first meeting our, it was like January 8th of that year. And uh, Coach Fleck was always a big motivator guy and like having your vision and setting your vision. And so walking into that meeting, like there was a big Cotton Bowl logo like on the screen. Mm. And he said, man, if we do our jobs, we will be here. And uh, it's, it's crazy how wow. like having a vision and a goal um, really drives you. And I mean, we knew we were going to be good. We had a bunch of guys returning. We had uh, Corey Davis, who was a stud. Mm-hmm. Um, our schedule kind of set up for us to go 13-0 um, and 0 like we did. So, yeah. So uh, I guess jumping into that. Um... 13 and 0, you actually did take one of those Big Ten wins that we talked about. What mm-hmm. was what was that like going against, you know, the Big Ten school? Everyone expects it's gonna be a little blowout. And you guys actually come out on top and pretty handily. What was that like? Yeah, so so we actually we won two Big Ten games that year. We beat Northwestern to start the year. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah okay. In a in a crazy game back and forth. Um but it's I mean it's pretty cool going into their stadiums and beating them. Um like I said, Coach Fleck was was a very was like a visionary, so um, we never went into those games thinking, oh, we're going to lose or, oh, we're probably not going to do very well. We always knew we were going to stay in the game and we were going to compete. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we got that win at Northwestern to start the year, I think that kind of gave us um, an idea of what we could be. And then later, like three games later, I think we played Illinois. And we, uh, I think we won by like 30. And they, I mean, they weren't very good, but still beating a Big Ten team yeah. in a Big Ten stadium, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So then you guys climb all the way, which is crazy to hear you say about the Cotton Bowl thing at the start of the season. Yeah. So you actually make it to the Cotton Bowl, which is wild. Um, wild. Although, you know, you guys ultimately didn't win. But what is, it, what is it like as a player being in a bowl environment and being in an arena like that? Like, what was it like from your perspective to be in there? Well, whenever people ask me, like, what a, what's a bowl like for a college football player? Like, because people think, oh, like, the go daddy bowl. Like who wants to go play in that? I think bulls are the, are the best. They're like, it's a yeah. free vacation for a college student. Um, you have some extra practices, which kind of suck, but a lot of times you're playing, they'll take care of you. Um, you get a bull gift. You get to be with all your buddies. Um, bulls are awesome. The cotton bowl experience was like first class. Um, anything we needed, um, they would, they'd provide for us. Like we had a gaming room or a huge ballroom of like uh, f- different foods and drinks that, and like arcade games if we wanted to play and, um, bulls, bulls are really honestly the best part of college football. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, that's where. So then, when you're in the arena, and I, I'm assuming that's probably like the biggest arena you've played in so far, <laughs> and it, I'm sure the loudest arena. Like, what was that like? Like walking into the arena. Like, are you? Do you get the chills instantly? Do you start getting the nerves? Like, how's that? So like the first um, uh, time we stepped in, the f- we we've got to practice there all week. But the first time we went into jerry's world it was it was awesome because you've always heard about it and but it's until you really see it like you don't have as much respect for it as you as you get like mm-hmm. the state the the um the jumbotron is massive like you have to look straight up to see anything on it um yeah. the seeing all the seats and like the suites just the on-field level around the stadium are awesome um but that week was awesome practicing we got to practice in jerry's world three or four times and then eventually wow. playing there on game day um, it was pretty cool. And seeing how many people from Western Michigan traveled down to the Cotton Bowl mm-hmm. and, like, really supported our team was, was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Man, so it, it sounds like one of the, the things that you keep bringing up is Coach Fleck and how much he meant to not only you but, like, the team as a whole. Um, is there anything that you could say about – I mean, obviously he's an extremely successful coach. Is there anything that you could say, like, is his personal difference maker and why you think he's successful? Um. Like I said earlier, I think he's a visionary. Like he, he sets a vision and he'll do whatever it takes to get to that point. And, you know, he'll cha- like he'll challenge you every day um, to constantly get better and, and change who you are uh, mm-hmm. for the better. And like, he's not afraid to challenge people. And, um, and so like, he was just, he, I mean, he's, he's a unique person. And uh, yeah. I think that's kind of who, what makes him as a coach who he is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is it so the coach dynamic in football is so interesting to me because there's so many people on the team. Mm-hmm. Um, 
do you genuinely get a chance to like establish a personal relationship with the head coach or is it more the like the positional coaches that you get closer with so i i, I don't know about bigger schools but at least at western um coach fleck was kind of he didn't really coach any one position he kind of coached the coaches if that makes sense mm. and so like you were always there if like he was always there if you needed to talk to him about anything and his door like he was really good about having an open door but um, I think in, in football, especially your position coach is kind of like your father figure. If I say like he, uh, you, you meet with him every day. Um, he knows more about you than probably any other coach on the staff. And um, he, and he generally uh, cares about your success and like what you're doing and the person you become, he kind of has the uh, biggest impact on you. Mm. Wow. Mm. That's funny. Like coach the coaches. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's the vision. Uh, but yeah, I, so he, he's – go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, he sets the path, and if the coach isn't following what his vision of where the program was going, then he'll, he'll, he'll get it up their ass just like a, <laughs> a player. Yeah. Like, he makes sure they're following the path and coaching us on the same vision that he has set. Mm. Um, the point I was going to make, like, that's, like, inspiring or interesting to hear, actually, because – that, I mean, just being in that ecosystem kind of gets you ready for life too, outside of football, right? Like yeah. if you ever want to lead a business or be part of a team, like understanding like those fundamentals, like I guess sometimes you don't think that like a coach would do that. You would just think it's all about football. It's all about you need to be faster, stronger, <laughs> yeah. bigger, strong, you know? You wouldn't think that he'd be like, no, this is our vision. We're going to combo. That's like how you lead a business or how you lead a yeah. team or anything. So this is what we're up to do. Uh, and that's how you do it. I find it interesting that he like decided to coach the coaches. Cause I yeah. like that style too. Like whoever's like the mm -hmm. ahead of stuff is like, no, nah, I want to talk to you about this. I want to talk to the people, you know? Yeah. Cause if, uh, if the players are doing it wrong, it's probably because the coaches mm -hmm. are not coaching yeah. it the correct way. Exactly. So the leaders aren't, aren't teaching it the right way. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's powerful, man. So it's, it seems like the, the role of a head coach, at least in that situation is just their, their roles to motivate the players when, when it's game day and all that. And yeah, obviously he, keep, keep the coaches intact. Right. Yeah. He, he coached the culture. He said, mm. Oh, Mm. That's a gem right there. Uh, so I have a question that's kind of off the beaten path. So how is, how is it like being like this big star walking around Western? Like, did you get to love <laughs> the girls? Like, what, like, how is it like when you get out of practice? Like, what is it like for you? Especially after I mean, the combo or leading up to that season. Like, how was, like, how was it? <laughs> I mean, it was fun. But, I mean, as an offensive lineman, you're kind of like, no, you don't, your stats aren't in the paper. And you kind of just know that going in. Like, you do the dirty work so that people actually can succeed in their own roles. So, um but I mean, the parties were pretty fun that year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, at the end of that season, at the end of 2016, um, you had that historic run, make it to the Cotton Bowl. And then Coach Fleck decides to take the job at Minnesota. Um, how open and transparent was he with the team leading into that? Like, was he letting you guys know um, that he was considering it and stuff like that? Or did it kind of catch you off guard? Um, I mean, I knew there was chance, there was a chance that he'd leave because mm -hmm. um, we were successful and um, programs across the country look for that, like a smaller guy uh, that gets successful at a small school to, to move up. So, uh, but I, I didn't really know he was leaving and he called me the, like the day he was leaving and told me that like um, it was a tough decision and it was what was best for his family and his future. So, I mean, I understood it. I, I know why he left and I don't, right. I don't have any hard feelings for it. For yeah. Time. The, the Minnesota check is a little bit different than the Western Michigan check. You know? Yeah, it is a lot different. <laughs> Yo, those yeah. checks, though, are wild. Like, I don't know, man. Yeah. Like, College football like, coaches? Yeah. I mean, like, I'm, I know it's hard work, but, like, dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's different. You get paid, bro. Yeah. They, I mean, they work a lot, like, too. Like, they work a lot of hours that you don't even know because they have to recruit. Like, college co – I, I, I bet college coach works more than NFL coach because college coaches have to recruit, too, which sucks. Mm. I, I, being a college coach, I bet recruiting would, would suck. Yeah, because you got to go to high schools and, you know, yeah. take pictures with these dudes, invite them to your campus. Yeah. Yeah. And your job's dependent on the success, too. Like, it if is. that happens, is your name in the mm -hmm. paper and – well, yeah, you're like, you're responsible for 105, 20, 9, 18 through 21 year olds, which is pretty stressful, probably. Most people have a hard time managing like four or five of those. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So, um, you know, after that, you guys never really made it back to like a 13 and 0 type of mm -hmm. run again. 
Um, how much of that would you say was adjusting to a new coach? And then obviously like you, like Corey Davis, like you mentioned, like you guys lost some pretty high tier talent. Yeah. I mean, I think coach Lester did as good as he could have done with the players that we had on roster. I, I, I love coach Lester. Um, and when he did, when he came in was, um, cause he had to rebuild the roster cause we lost our star quarterback who was there for four years. Mm-hmm. We lost our three starting receivers. We lost two O linemen. Uh, one was a fourth or third round pick. Um, so like we had a lot of like change in our roster. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think just getting a six and six was, um, was pretty impressive that year. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when you get a new coach in a sport like that, um, I guess for you personally, did you click right away? Was it, was it kind of awkward? Like how long does it take for you to truly get comfortable? So, I mean, you, like he, like he came in and he talked to the whole team. It's, it usually takes a couple of weeks of adjusting to, to the new guy that comes in and kind of getting a feel. He'll get a feel for you and you get a feel for him. Um, kind of like what, like what's his thoughts and like where's he want to take this program and stuff. Um, but be, like I was able to be on a leadership council. So he spoke to us a lot. Um, about his vision and his culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got to know him pretty good, uh, pretty fast. But for most people, I'd probably say it takes a couple months to get to grow, to get used to the new coach and the new culture that's set in place. Yeah. Yeah. So um, um, go ahead. Like, who, who did you, I have two questions. Who did you see while playing? You're like, man, that person is really good. Like in college, like, and then when did you also realize like, yo, I'm also really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, I always tell people, like, when they ask me who the toughest person I played against in college was, I, I say it was Mike McDowell. Um, I mean, he was a freak. He was, like, 6'7", 305, long arms. Uh, I mean, he was also really good because I was an 18-year-old freshman playing my first game. So, maybe that has something to do with me saying he was the best. But um, he was really good. Um, I played against Joey Bosa the same year. I didn't. Mm. I only blocked him a couple times. Um, he was a freak. Um, That's so crazy. I mean, but I, play, I, got, I got a chance to play against a lot of good players in my career. Yeah. And then I, I found I, – I felt like I knew I was pretty good. Um, I, I, was, I made second team all-conference my sophomore year, and I, I didn't even think I played very good. Um, mm-hmm. And so that, that next year, um, when I was – like, when I made first team all-conference, I knew, like, I might get a chance to play in the NFL or, or, like, be able to live my dream. So, yeah. That's crazy, dude. That feeling must be nuts. Mm. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is, you know, throughout the time that you were at Western and even in high school, you were always able to keep on top of sports and grades. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something that you feel like you just were self-motivated for? Was that something like the family put inside of you? Obviously, being a principal's kid, you kind of <laughs> – you're held to a different standard. Yeah, you don't be a bad principal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, growing up, like, my dad always kind of emphasized school and, and how school and, and football kind of go together. And um, that if you want to be good in football, that you have to do well in the classroom. So, um, he kind of instilled in, in me early that to do good on the football field, you must do good in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that kind of carried over. And constantly having him in, in the school, like, um, it was, I mean, it was <laughs> easy for you. me. Yeah, watching over me. It was easy for me to, to concentrate on school and, yeah, um, and do my own work. Honestly, like I was more, I was more nervous if I did something bad and my mom was pissed at me than my mm. dad. She was always like, she always came down and cracked the whip. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. She yelled at me a few times in the hallways. I remember. <laughs> yeah, she'll get you. <laughs> Mosquito. Yeah, your parents, your parents are definitely cool though. Yeah. You know yeah. yeah. They, I mean, they were, they were a great support system for me growing up. If I ever, whenever I needed something or um advice or because I mean they both were college athletes so mm-hmm. they kind of both kind of set the path for me and my sister and and how we acted and, and like how what how what school work and what it can do for your future and they kind of set that up for me and her yeah yeah so was there a lot of sacrificing that you had to do I mean you said you you know the football parties were fun so that means that you were still there um yeah. was there like a lot of sacrifices you had to make in order to balance both um I mean there were a few yet definitely time especially early in my college career, I was, I had to make sure like I was spending enough time on my, on my schoolwork to, to be able to do well. And, uh, mm-hmm. but I mean, like as a college student, you have a couple of days off a week and, um, you know, like if you, if you had a chance to go party and hang out with your teammates, you were creating more than just a party. You were, you were bonding and building that, 
um, kind of brotherhood with your teammates. So That's true. I mean, I think being able to mix that in with schoolwork and, and workouts and football, I think that that definitely helped. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, I guess staying on that family front, um, our senior year of high school, your dad, unfortunately, had health issues. Um, mm-hmm. and that kind of trickled over. I mean, you know, for as, as long as it happened, how hard was that balancing, you know, struggle at home and then you know, like you're a freshman in college trying to figure all that out? You know, it was tough, especially knowing that right when he like he like came down with cancer that um, I was leaving. So um, mm. just knowing that like I my, the burden was put from me and my sister to my mom mainly and she dealt with it like a champion. And, you know, that that kind of inspires me and like what she did during those times because they were tough. Yeah. And uh, not being able to be there was really hard for me. Um, I mean, I went home weekends, but like I did to, to, to do what I wanted to do in football and my, what my dad had wanted me to do. So I knew he would want me to keep working at football and not really come home. Um, the burden was really on my mom and seeing yeah. how hard she worked during that time was tough. Yeah. Wow. Uh, how's he doing now? He's doing good. He's, uh, good. he's back working. He's, uh, we're trying to keep him in the house so he doesn't get any. <laughs> This, this virus so yeah but that's hard he, he he likes to get up and do things yeah he's not he's not working for ek still is he nope he's uh okay. he's working along with them he just he's a okay. different role he's kind of like a consultant gotcha oh, that's gotcha. sick i was gonna say I, i'm pretty sure like your dad's a great principal i don't know yeah, how to he... judge that but like as a student <laughs> there i'm pretty sure like it was pretty lit at ek like i'm like in my older way, looking back at it, like that was a good school. Like, yeah, we like, whatever family. people like thought, like you told me you went to EK and thought like you were going to school in the hood. I'm like, dude, EK is nice. I know you guys talking about. Yeah, yeah. I think he, <laughs> you know I think he, he had a good balance between fun and accountability, and and like making sure people were held accountable and doing their work, but still like having school pride and having fun in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good to hear that he's doing well, man. That's good. Yeah, appreciate yeah. that. That's good. Yeah, was was that like a conversation that like your mom had or even you were able to have with your dad? Like, hey, don't worry about what's going on. I got us. Just, you know, focus on what you have to do. Yeah, I knew like um, having that sitting down with them before I kind of went to college, I kind of knew like that was what what was needed to happen. And um, my mom kind of said, John, you go do your thing. We'll handle it back here. You just do whatever you can do to be the best you can do at football Mm -hmm. at this time. And you know, that would, that will help your dad. Like it'll give him something to look forward to and um, something to strive for. So I think yeah. definitely having my mom say that to me helped, mm-hmm. uh, but I mean, it was still hard being away from him during that tough time. Yeah, of course. Right. Of course. Yeah. I remember when he was at um, senior graduation, it was like the biggest event. Cause it's like, <laughs> oh, it's, it's like principal Kino again. And then he was like there and he was able to give everybody hugs and handshakes. It was, it was a cool. Moment. Yeah. yeah. It was cool. He, he really enjoyed that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess one of the, the last things I had to ask about college was, uh, you had the chance to play along John Wasink, who I know you played with growing up. Um, mm-hmm. what was it like, you know, 10 years or however long removed and you guys are playing with each other again on a big <laughs> stage? Like, what was that feeling like? Did you guys ever get a chance to talk about it? So I remember when he was being recruited, he, he hadn't committed to Western Michigan when I was already committed. And, and uh, I knew John, cause I, I, like you said, I played with him growing up, mm-hmm. um, and, and I saw when he got the Western Michigan offer, I, I hit him up right away on text. I was like, come on, John, let's go do it like we did it in, in Little League football. And yeah. um, he was like, sure, sure, whatever. And then a couple of months later, he committed. And um, it was it was awesome being able to play with him again. And mm-hmm. um, pulling back the pictures of me and him playing back in like sixth grade was pretty, was pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he ended up being a pretty important part of that team in the last few years. So. It must have been fun for you or your, your families to, like, look back in the stands and stuff like that. It'd be, like, flashbacks yeah, when he, all over. Yeah, when he took over at quarterback my junior year, it was kind of nuts. Like, I was snapping to John again because that's exactly what I was doing in sixth grade. Yeah. Like, they had, all the, they had all the pictures and stuff. So, I mean, they really enjoyed it, and I think we did too. That's funny. That's awesome. Um, so, I guess that pretty much wraps up everything for college. Um, and then leading into – the NFL draft, you unfortunately weren't drafted. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, did you expect on draft night that your phone was going to ring? Like, were you lo- looking to, for it? I mean, I mean as a kid, well, I mean, w- when you're like at that level, you're kind of always like hoping, oh, I hope I get picked. Mm-hmm. Um, but like knowing, like I knew where I was at and I was comfortable knowing that I'd be either a late round pick or an undrafted guy. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, when it comes to those later rounds, you never really know what team you're going to go in and if you go in the right fit or not. So um, kind of being able to pick and choose where I went, um, I think, helped me by not being picked in the last couple rounds. But, um, you know, you'd always want to be picked, but not being picked was just another, uh, another mm-hmm. part of my journey. Wow. Yeah. And then from there, you went to Minnesota um, and signed with the Vikings. What was uh, I, we'll kind of get through like the steps that led to that, but what what was the feeling to actually sign a contract? I'm in the NFL. Like, what was that first initial feeling like? <laughs> I mean, it was a kind of a dream come true because yeah, I grew, started in third grade and um, I always wanted to play in college, and then I wanted to play in the NFL. Um, so just being able to kind of get to that point and be like, wow, I I did it. I'm living the dream. So um, whenever someone asks me how I'm doing, I'd say I'm living the dream. So mm. I mean, it's pretty cool and. Um, just being able to get to that point with both my parents standing next to me because they were there the whole journey. Yeah. Um, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. Was it, was it kind of like a, like a sigh, like all the work that I put in is actually wor- it was worth it the whole time. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was yeah. nice. Uh, that feeling was nice. And um, I, you know, I was just excited kind of for what was next and seeing like what really the NFL is all about. Yeah. Um, and if I remember right, the Vikings were pretty deep at your position, right? So yeah. The, they drafted the center in the first round that yeah. same year. So, so was that like, uh, oh man, like out of all the teams to sign me while I was at this this team, <laughs> like was that kind of a thought that went in your head? I was, honestly, I was just happy to get the opportunity to play at that level. Yeah. And um, you know, looking back on it, I, maybe I shouldn't have gone to that team, but um, <laughs> it was all it was an awesome experience being able to play with Garrett, who was the first round pick, mm-hmm. um, and just kind of getting to watch him and watch him develop and seeing like how truly like, talented he is. Yeah. So we talked about the jump from high school to college. What's the jump from college to the NFL? Like, are, is it another 50 pounds? Like, what's the difference? So I think the biggest jump is everybody's good. You can be a, you can be a third teamer, a fourth teamer. You're freaking good. To get to that point in your career or to get to the NFL at any time, like, you yeah. have to be talented. You, you have to both be smart. You have to be physically talented. Um, constantly have to be, like, knowing what you're doing. Um, you have to be good on and off the field. So you have to be in, in tune in meetings. Um, people like, I always tell people like, um, there's about 10 guys on the NFL roster that you're like, holy cow, like these guys are freaking athletic. And the rest of the guys are just hard nose, hard, come to, come to, come to work every day with a great mentality and we just work really hard. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy to think about it. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like, we hear we, – yeah. we talked to Xavier about that and, like, his journey from high school to college, and he was talking about the same thing. It's like you get to a certain point, and all the people who made it there just off athleticism, they just kind of weed out, and you're just yeah. surrounded by people who understand the game on such a high level that you just it, – it's crazy, you know? It is. It's nuts. Yeah. So, so then – go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. So, uh, following the Minnesota, you unfortunately get cut. And then, like you said, you get signed to the practice team and get cut from that as well. Um, kind of walk me through, obviously, I don't, I don't expect you to be like, oh, it was easy to go through. <laughs> but, like, you know, you made it to the NFL, and then, unfortunately, you got cut. Like, how does your mindset go? Does your mindset tell you to get in the gym for eight hours a day? Or, like, so, what, what was it like? And, you know, it was, I knew I kind of had a feeling I was going to be cut after camp. Um, I was hoping to be brought back to the practice squad right after camp, but um, I wasn't. But – in my head, I, I knew it was just another another part of the journey for me. And, um, you know, I was willing to keep working to stay in the NFL. So um, I didn't get picked up for 10 weeks. And so those 10 weeks, every day I was mm. um, I was in the gym working by myself. Um, I'd, go to, I'd go to help at Western Michigan to help coach, like, in the morning. So I'd wake up early. I'd drive to Kalamazoo. I'd sit in the meetings, and I'd go out to the practices just to watch, to keep my head in the game and kind of, like, keep me on the schedule. And then I'd lift after by myself. Mm. Um, it was tough, but like I knew if I ever wanted that shot to be back in the NFL, that um, I had to continue to work as if I was in the NFL. So, mm. um, and then when I got the call in week eleven, I think to get come back and join the practice squad, it was like I said, a dream come true. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, what, what, what was? Go ahead, Vince. I can't. Oh, yeah, I don't want to pry too much. <laughs> what is that? So, like you say, you signed a contract. How does that all work? Like, are you getting paid to do this? Is it more like, are you like, do? need money like how, how does that work while you're signing a contract and you're in that whole process so while i was with the vikings i was making um like the off season like you get paid for like an off season salary yeah and then you get a preseason salary so i was getting paid my whole time i was in minnesota 
Um, and then for the practice squad, like it gets, it jumps way up and then the active roster jumps way, way up, <laughs> but the practice squad, you make good money. Um, and so like, like right now with the Steelers, I'm just making, I'm making whatever we make during off season, which is decent money. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's like, man, you get cut. Like, do they cut your check too? Like, that's not cool. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it is, it, yeah. So like after, after preseason, I got cut and that's why I came home to like, my parents were like right there, like, Hey, come live with us. It's free. Uh, just continue to work hard every day. And like, if you want to keep living the dream, like we're here to help you. So. That's awesome that you had that support oh, wow. system, man. Yeah. Yeah. So then from there, uh, you get cut from the practice squad and then the XFL phone number starts, starts ringing. Um, from, you know, you made it to the NFL and then you get the call from the X XFL. What was that like? Um, did you believe in the vision um, of the up and coming league? Like, were you excited to be there? Yeah. So I, so in October, before I got signed back to the Vikings, I got, I was picked in like the XFL draft. Mm. And uh, so I was planning on going like, if, cause I was training still and I was like, I'm going to keep playing football. So I was going to go play in the XFL. And th then I got the call from the Vikings. So then I joined the Vikings and I was thinking, I'm not going to play in XFL. Um, and then after week 17, I got cut by the Vikings on three days later, I was on my way to Dallas to play in XFL. And, uh, you know, it was an awesome opportunity. I loved X. Like I wish the XFL was to keep, was, was to keep going because it was, yeah. a, it was a great opportunity for a lot of guys to get filmed. Um, and in football film is your resume. So any, t any chance you can get to put good tape out there, it, it helps guys. And I mean, it was a fun league. Like the people that were part of the XFL were awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, it sucks that it's what it is now. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was part of you nervous at all for, you know, kind of jumping into this new idea, you know, this fresh idea, were you nervous about it or were you, you know, just focused on football? I was a little nervous. Um, I knew a couple guys on the team, which helped. Um, mm -hmm. but like going in, like, I was like, I'm thinking like, oh, I'd come from the NFL. Like this league's going to be cake. Yeah. And when you get there, like you realize people, like, it doesn't matter at the, at, when you're a professional football player, everybody is still good players. It's like, the, like I came in kind of late. So, um, I kind of pick up everything, but when I got there, like I was initially really shocked with how good the players were in XFL. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think, I mean, I shouldn't have been, but like, <laughs> that's just how it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was it a, like a similar type of jump from college? Did you feel like you were playing college ball again or could you tell that everyone yeah, was more that talented? Fit? So it, it was definitely above college football. The XFL okay. was somewhere between, um, the bottom, like probably 10 guys on the roster and a practice squad. So like everyone was pretty good, but it was just like, they didn't, they couldn't, they didn't have any more practice by eligibility. So they couldn't be on an NFL practice squad or, um, mm. they the teams just didn't want their contracts in the NFL. So like they needed a place to play. They were still good players. It was just, they didn't fit on the NFL team right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you sign the team, you, you make it there and made it to the XFL. You eventually start on the starting roster. You're getting a lot of minutes. And then I don't know how the phone call came, but you get the phone call that unfortunately coronavirus is going to fold not only the season, but the company, which I was surprised to hear about. Yeah. Me too. Um, what, what was that was that phone call like was that from the coaches was it from the media like how'd you hear about it so originally we got sent home I think after week six and I, I had started the pre previous two games which were, my, which were my first starts in XFL which went pretty good and I was planning on starting the next week so we got done with practice on that Thursday which are like the hardest practices of course mm -hmm. and uh coach Stoops called him calls us all into a meeting and like I mean we're seeing reports that like the NCAA tournament is maybe canceled or whatever so we kind of had an idea that something was happening and uh he called us in and said hey guys we got to go home we're hoping to start back up in a couple weeks when this thing kind of chills out and so mm -hmm. next day we had we head home um and then a couple weeks later we get a call or I don't even get a call I uh one of my buddies sent me a text and said hey looks like the XFL is canceled and I was like I didn't believe it oh so God. I checked Twitter and I was like Jeez, like and it's said the XFL is canceled for the rest of the season and they're gonna have to lay players off. It was nuts. Wow. Wow. So you, you yeah. found out through Twitter like I did. Yeah, I found out through Twitter. <laughs> That's so annoying. <laughs> it is That's annoying. Crazy. Um so here's a funny question. Are you getting unemployment checks? Is that how this works? So uh I was so like I got so like the XFL was still paying us when they sent us home. Okay. And uh and I was gonna file for unemployment. And it was, it was freaking hard to sign up for unemployment. I'll tell you what, I didn't realize how hard it is to sign up for that. Yeah. And so, um, but like, I couldn't sign up for a couple of days. And then the next day I got a call from like the Steelers and they were like, John, mm -hmm. we want to sign you. 
and so like I signed with them, so they're paying me now. So just log off the computer real quick. All right, I won't. Yeah, uh, I don't. I, I don't. Need I don't need to do that appointment anymore. <laughs> yeah, for now. So, yeah, I mean, we might as well jump right into that, man. Like uh, talking. I mean, we've gone through the whole journey up to this point, right? Like, yeah, kind of fighting against the odds, and then you get the call from the Steelers, one of the historic franchises of the NFL. Um, how hard? How how fast is your heart pumping? Like, what what's that feeling like to get that phone call? I mean, it was nuts. Like, it was 10.30 in the morning. Like, I, I, like coronavirus has messed up my whole sleep schedule. So, <laughs> yeah. like, I, I mean, I was working on stuff. And uh, I get, like, my agent calls me. And, like, he was, like, he, I guess he had called me before. And I didn't answer because I was sleeping. I was, like, John, John, you got to wake up. It was, like, the Steelers want to sign you today. I was, like, okay. What? Like, <laughs> it was awesome. It was, like, I didn't, like, I didn't even re- realize what he was saying because I had just woken up. But, yeah. um, I mean, being able, like, signing with the Steelers is awesome. And, like, the amount of. Uh, fans that have reached out to me that I, I didn't even know they were Steelers fans. Mm. Um, I've been pretty cool. Yeah. So Dude, that must be wild, man. man it wild. was. It was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm just at home waiting on it. Like I didn't think about. Getting, I was thinking about getting a regular job, and I was continuing to work out. But like at this point, like I didn't know what was next, especially with like what the virus is doing, and mm-hmm. just being able to get the call to keep living the dream is is awesome. Man, congrats by the way. I think yeah, that's thank, a big you know, round you of applause, man. That's crazy. <laughs> Um, Nuts. so, you know, talking about the Steelers, man, like, wh- what are you excited about going into? Obviously you're excited to continue to play the game that you love, but like, what does it mean to, that it's the Steelers? Like now that you get your, your chance, you know, I mean, it was, it's just an awesome opportunity just with any organization in NFL, but especially the Steelers and how um, successful they've been and, and the type of organization they are with, um, with the Pittsburgh community is awesome. And, um, yeah. I, I played with a couple guys that are on Steelers at Western Michigan. So, um, being able to rejoin them and um, just being able to have another shot in the NFL is a dream. You, most, yeah. most guys don't get one, so getting getting two is pretty cool. Yeah, but that is huge. So, what are they? What is the rumblings internally about when they're gonna get back to play and all that kind of stuff? Like, so we we know as much as you guys probably. <laughs> um, so I guess we can't we can't really we're like we're doing virtual. I had my first virtual OTA today, which is like through a camera. And uh, we just kind of go over the plays and stuff. And we'll do that for the next three weeks. Um, and we can't – like, we, we're supposed to have an off-season program from now until June 25th-ish. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we're, we're not going to the facilities for now. Um, and the only way we're going to be able to report is if every team's state allows us to. So, like, mm. um, every – it's like Pittsburgh. or So Pennsylvania has to allow um, – us to go to the facility and be able to practice but so does like so like michigan for the detroit lions and it's like yeah. every state has to be um ready be open yeah be ready wow that's crazy so <laughs> we're just hoping we're just hoping when fall comes that we're able to start camp yeah um, i think so then how how is your your practice and like preparation changed are you just you know lifting when you can obviously you can't really get on a field it's not like you're gonna you know practice yeah. practice against nobody right now so um, I was working out like Western skates were open. So I was able to work out on the field down there. Uh, they've recently locked them, but uh, <laughs> having, having my dad as a principal and trying to find places around town that have gyms um, that I can work out in is nice. And um, one of my buddies just got assigned last or Sunday with the Eagles. Um, mm. So we've been kind of working out together and trying to find different places around town. And yeah, um, it's tough, but like you got to kind of make do with what you got. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So to, when, when you, you know, you, you got signed and all that, does part of you in the back of your mind be like, ah, oh, like, of course it's right now during this whole thing. Or are you just like, you, yeah, do you block out all that negative and all that? I, yeah. I was just happy to be part of the team yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and just get the call. So like nothing, I mean, if the virus keeps us away, it's just more of an opportunity for me to uh, keep working and trying to get better while I'm home. So yeah, I mean, it gets, lets me stay home with my family and work out, but, um, I was just happy to get the call. Yeah, that's good. Try to make the most of it. Mm-hmm. So now that you've made it onto the you know the biggest football stage, who have do you have a lot of mentors? Um, whether it's you know previous coaches or you know teammates, do you have a good um, support system of people actually in the game that you can you can reach out to? Oh yeah, a lot of my uh, college coaches have been there and reaching out to me if I never needed anything. Or um, I mean, most of the time when, when things would be open. Um, my strength coach in college was, was always there for me. And um, he, he really gives me a chance to come back and lift and give me different workouts and, and things. Um, I've been in contact with my past line coaches. Like I said, like 
they, they're the ones who like really get to know you the best and um, they've reached out to me and if whenever I need anything I, I'm free to reach out to them so mm-hmm. um, I have a lot of guys like different people around me that I think are, are good are good it's a good support system for me yeah that's good that's mm-hmm. good man what a journey man what a I know it's nuts. Yeah. it's nuts. That yeah. the NFL is nuts. Everyone thinks like, oh, everyone goes in and makes millions of dollars, but there's a lot of guys that, you know, are are, are living week to week and, and just happy to be there. So yeah, yeah. And just and it's gets a good opportunity for a lot of people. Right. Wow. All right. That's so powerful, man. I know. I I've probably spent <laughs> like thirty months or thirty weeks in a hotel in the last year, which is probably more than most people spend in a lifetime. Yeah, dude. I was about to say, like, you're living and everything, like, you have, so, are you still close with, like, the kids you grew up with, like? like oh, yeah, yeah, we text all the time, and we, uh, like, we, I would go see him right now, but everything's locked down, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. What if all the rules? Well, then. <laughs> yeah, I gotta follow the rules. <laughs> Guys, stay safe. Yeah. Um, the, I guess the last football-related thing that I wanted to talk about was kind of um, your viewpoint on the game as a whole. And, you know, uh, it seems like a new report kind of comes out every few weeks about, you know, X player has this brain damage and, you know, we need to cancel the game. How do you view it, man? Like, are you concerned about your health? Are you concerned about all this? Like, are you going to let your kids play? Like, how do you view the game? You know, I, I, I love football and everything it's given me. It's taught me so many life lessons. And, um, yeah, I, I know there's, like, stuff about the brain. But, I mean, that was kind of a different era of football. And, and like, I'll, I'll continue to play as long as I can play. And um, when I'm when I'm a father, hopefully uh, my kids want to play. I mean, it's their choice, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't push people against playing football. I think there's so many lessons that are in team sports and, and football generally that I think it's good for people to play. And it builds character, it builds toughness, teamwork. Um, it teaches a lot of, like, life lessons, too. So, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I see these reports and I think, yeah, that, that would be a bad thing. <laughs> but, like... <laughs> I think there's a lot of good things in football too. And, they, and yeah. they're trying to make the game safer, I think at all levels. And um, as we grow, I mean, we'll find out more stuff and more information about how to start and maybe, maybe starting at an older age or um, like with flags or maybe not hitting right away. Maybe that'll be beneficial, but mm-hmm. um, I think generally, I think football's really in a good spot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying about, you know, life lessons and all that. I mean, it's, it's so true. I, I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of the toughness and determination, I mean, you can even pick that, that up from your journey, right? Like yeah, those 10 weeks that you decided to go to the gym, there's a lot of people that, you know, week three comes around and they're done working out and the dream's over, you know? Yeah. Like, there's a lot of failure that you learn from and you get to learn from in football. And mm-hmm. um, I've, I've been blessed with the amount of people and I've got to meet and the relationships I've been able to build because of football. Um, yeah. I mean, th- you know, I, those are like not replaceable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I think we see that a lot. Like a lot of the, you know, really successful people on high levels come from some sort of competition background, right? Cause you need that level of failing over and over and over again, but still, mm-hmm. you know, showing up to practice and all that kind of stuff, you know, it's true. I guess, you yeah. know, like, that kind of transitions really well into uh, a bit of teamwork and leadership that we learned this week, uh, watching Mr. Yeah. Michael Jordan do his thing. Um, I guess, you know, jumping into episode three and four, like, what would you guys take away from this week's two episodes? What would you guys see? I mean, for me, it was cool to uh, – I, I, I made a joke about uh, Robin just kind of inventing black dudes getting their hair dyed different colors. <laughs> and, like, this whole, like, uh, don't really care bad boy, like, image. But, like, still a dog and, like, in a very – as much as – Jordan's a genius in scoring, like his genius in defense and like being able to rebound. I was just like, dude, like we don't talk about him enough either. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like we don't talk like, you know, Pimmy wasn't playing like during that time, whatever. But like, it, it, it's crazy to see like, you know, he's also, he's wild for sure. Definitely <laughs> crazy. Like you can't, you definitely let him do what he wants to do. But like to see him play also like, man, like I was watching some of the clips. I'm like, the way he, like, angled that ball all the time, like, that must have been frustrating, like, to, to go against him trying to get a board. Mm-hmm. I bet he was annoying to play against. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. They, like, they showed a stat or something. Like, he had so many, like, 10 or so games where he had over 20 rebounds and no points, which is just a nuts stat. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. crazy. It is nuts. Yeah. And then talking crap at the same time, getting your <laughs> in your head. Yeah. Like, 
that must have been just an annoying pain in the ass, basically. Yeah. But then he's also not some small dude. Like, is it Beasley right now who's, like, the, the, de- the defensive annoying dude? Like, he's, like, whatever. Like, he's not that scary and intimidating. Like, Rahman's also, like, this big dude that's, like, what's up? Yeah, and he's, he's nuts. Yeah. And he's crazy. He's right? You want to fight, you can fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was funny watching it from the opposite perspective of when he was in Detroit and, like, when Michael had to go against that type of player. Yeah. And then, like, oh, man, I just – Acquiring that. Yeah, yeah, like – I, th- I think that's important, man. I, I, we see it in, like, LeBron's career, right, when you don't have the the two and three guys or even the two. Like, you just – it's you can't win alone. And that's, like, a life lesson, right? Like, you can't win. You need There's teammates. No, yeah, you yeah. need teammates. You need a team, you know? Yeah. I thought it was interesting how kind of the bad boys kind of made Michael who he is. They they kind of toughened him up. They were, like, his early years where he, he, took, he took his bruises, but they kind of made him better for it. Mm-hmm. They kind of made – because, like, after they, he lost in the conference finals the second time, he, they said he started lifting and, um, like, he got he got bigger and stronger. And, and then he became Michael Jordan. That I mean, he was already a, a stud, but he became, yeah. like, dominant. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the most powerful things is when they were talking about he had to learn how to be a teammate and mm-hmm. learn, uh, you know, scoring 38 a season, which, first of all, is crazy. Um, you know, scoring 38 points a game isn't necessarily going to win you a championship. And then yeah. – you know, he had to realize, I mean, the, the example was passing it off to Paxton and stuff like that. It's like, I think, you know, without the bad boys, we might not be having, the, you know, the Jordan conversation as we have it now, you know? I agree. Yeah, and like, I'll say this, and I always say this, like, hearing the story, I get it. I get why they consider him the greatest of all time. I understand. And it's like, again, there's the story, the legacy of everything. It's like, cool to like, we, we weren't old enough. So, like, we missed yeah. out on that. So, like, it's cool to like, how they recanted. Now, obviously, they're probably going to buffer it up a little bit more. Yeah. But like, before we started recording, John, you had like, a good like insight. I wonder if they're going to show like his like also him wilding out too. Yeah. Like, is, is it always going to be like good promo? Um, <laughs> well, one thing I, I did love too, you can definitely see all these guys are just as competitive, even though, even though they're old. Like Michael, <laughs> like when they're talking about that, he's like, I don't want to see anything he had to say. Like, <laughs> like he still like has like a chip on his shoulder about this. And that was years ago. Yeah. He's, done yeah, he still he's, exists, his, yeah. like, he's like, nah, but I don't want to hear anything he says. It's bullshit. Nah. <laughs> like, it's like, can't turn it off, man. He's like, dude, can't turn it off. <laughs> cannot turn it off, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What'd you guys think of like Isaiah Thomas and the bad boys not shaking hands and them kind of justifying it all those years later? What'd you guys think about that? I mean, it was like, they were like, that's what the Celtics had done to them. Like when they were going through their, their like, growing pains and, like, I mean, it was kind of BS because, like, the two years before, Michael had congratulated them when they won. But, I mean, mm-hmm. they were the bad boys. So, uh, I mean, I wish I wish um, Isaiah would just have said, yeah, we didn't shake their hands because, like, that's just who we were. But instead he tried yeah. to kind of, like, like, go back and be like, oh, we didn't do it because, like, this reason. But, like, I wish he would just have said, like, hey, like, we're the bad boys, so that's why we didn't shake hands because, like, that, that was just us passing the torch. Mm-hmm. But he tried to kind of come back and say, like, oh, we would have – yeah. Yeah, I didn't like that too. Said either. Like, nah, bro, you didn't want to shake anybody's hand. You were mad at you off. Yeah, just say it. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, like all like what you're saying, Vince, like all these years later. And it's still like, oh, like why would we shake hands? We didn't know we were supposed to do that. It's like, come on, man. Yeah, like that's come how you should like they they're not gonna give that up. Like that's yeah. who they are as people. Yeah. I like, guess Michael kept Isaiah off the ninth or I don't know what year the dream team was, but Michael kept Isaiah off the dream team because he hated uh Isaiah. <laughs> Like, he told the coach, like, if he's playing, then I'm not playing. So, like, they couldn't be on the same team. Yeah. So, I'm sure there's grudges between those two. Yeah. Oh, hundred. I mean, Isaiah is the only one that can probably really walk around and be like, yeah, like, me and the boys. Yeah. We beat Jordan. Yeah. For someone like MJ, like, no one can say that. Everyone was like, he's the greatest ever. Isaiah is like, ah, LeBron's better. <laughs> like, it is like, it is like hilarious to me. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the, the interesting things, like, growing up, we always heard that, like, you know, Jordan's not the best because he was getting run out by the Pistons. But, like, the way that the documentary explained it was, like, eye-opening for me because it was, like, like you said, John, that they lost two or three years in a row. I think it was three years. And then they all got in the gym. They figured out how to play. And then the next year they what? swept them, right? Like, they didn't mm-hmm. trade for – KD they didn't trade for like some all-star like they just got better and won and I think I mean me and Vince were talking about it while we were watching it. it's like I think that adds to the legacy I don't think that takes away from it 
No, I agree. Yeah. What I feel like would take away is like, oh, if they called like Reggie Miller and got him on the team and that's who they needed to win, right? But they all just, just, just got better. Like we're going to learn how to be better as a team. And then they won, you know? Yeah. And they, they did have a great team, I think, to your point, Sam. And the coaches went, they had to learn how to play together. Like it was mm-hmm. definitely the Michael show, right? Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. the Pistons like exposed them every single time. Yeah, like, I think we see Bron- that. Like, same thing, LeBron is exposed too. Like LeBron can have, he'll have a forty-point game and he'll still lose. I think, I think that <laughs> you know, kind of shows like how good Phil Jackson was as a coach because like they made it to the conference finals with the guy they I don't I forget his name, um okay. they had before uh, and then they Phil fired Collins, him. I think. Yeah, Phil Collins. They fired Phil Collins after they made it to the champion or the conference championship and they fired him and let Phil take over, mm-hmm. and then Phil kind of instilled in the, like them the power of being a team and like it's more than just one person having the ball and like. Yeah. Like looking at Phil, he's won 13 NBA championships this year. Two as a player and 11 as a coach. So I mean that's so pretty crazy. nuts. Yeah. I didn't realize that about him, but he's I, a winner. I didn't. I, I knew yeah. he had played in the league, but I didn't know that he was good and like a champion. I had no idea about that. Yeah, me either. Right. Well, me either. Which makes sense why he, you know, can coach championship people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying he gets it. He's like, nah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Like imagine keeping like those personalities together. Like you had Michael. And then you had Scotty, who didn't say a word, it looked like. And then you had Rodman, who later – I mean, they later got Rodman. But, like, yeah. imagine being the coach of that team and keeping everybody peaceful. Like, mm-hmm. like LeBron can't really keep a coach for more than a couple of years because, like, his personality probably wears on him. But Phil was so, like, mellow and chill and, like, able to communicate with everyone on the team and mm-hmm. kept them together. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. I think we see that with – ironically enough, I think we see that with Steve Kerr, who played under Phil Jackson, like – you know, you need yeah. that, that coach. Player coach definitely helps. Like, you have an ex-player, and especially an ex-champion in Phil's, in Phil's case. But, you know, having someone who can relate to the players, calm them down, let them know, like, the emotions they're feeling are valid and all that. I think all that's the intangibles, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kurt, he didn't say this in a documentary, but I heard, like, him, like, they interviewed him, and he was talking about Steph, and he was like, yo, I just let my players be them. And then he, like, just, like, hypes him up. Like, there's, like, audio of, like, Steph shooting. He's, like, have a bad shooting game. He was, like, dude, you're the best shooter in the game. Like, he's, like, hyping him up, like, well, how you pull up and have a court like that? I, I would never have the confidence. And, like, he hypes them up, bro. And, like, I think he, like, he played for a winning team, like you said, Sam. Mm-hmm. He knows it. He knows the DNA. He knows what it takes to, like, actually win. And he was yeah. a complete part of that, mm-hmm. which is, like, crazy to think about. <laughs> yeah. 13 championships, man. That's like – that's like Kareem that's, Abdul-Jabbar type stuff. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, I, I, at the end of episode four, they were they were hinting at what the next episodes were going to be, but I don't remember. Do you guys remember what they were going to be? No. I heard Kobe's going to be on one of the next couple, which is going to be sad. Oh, man. my God. I'm going to get emotional. Yeah. Talking about passing the torch and all that probably. Yeah. Dude, yeah, there's on. a Maybe. lot. Of, I mean, like you guys are talking about gambling and stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of chapters of this documentary that are still left. You know. Yeah, because like <laughs> originally they showed like when Michael first got to Cleveland, and like he walked into that room with all the drugs and like strippers and stuff, and like he was like, "Nah, man, like that's not for me." But now, like we know, like <laughs> later on in his career, he, can't, he becomes a pretty big yeah. gambler and drinker. So it's, it'll be interesting if they show any of that. But I don't know because it's a, it is on ESPN, which is a Disney thing. But true, who knows? True. That's what yeah. I'm interested in too. How where they're gonna peel back the layers? Yes. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Perspectives. They and, gotta at least mention it, right? Like I don't know how in depth they're gonna go on it, but they gotta at least talk about it. I have a feeling they're gonna talk about it. Talk about it. That's like my gut thing. Like, <laughs> they're gonna so. get into it. Yeah, because like the producers of the show know like it's such a vital part to Michael and like mm-hmm. the story and it's everyone how it's, involved. Yeah, it's how it's who he is. He's a competitor in yeah. everything he does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. he like walking out. Like, imagine playing like in the casino. You're drunk, and you walk in to go play a game, <laughs> and drop thirty five or something. Drop, like that. Yeah, like you know, like that's let's say he wasn't drunk, but like, you know, like that's just crazy to me. Like out, like like LeBron takes care of his body. He's not out here. He works mm-hmm. out. That's what he does. Yeah, and like Michael was out here, bro. Like, oh, let's go. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, like tonight. Yeah. He's like, oh, we got a game in thirty minutes. Let me slide up real quick. Drop forty. I'll see you guys later. Like, <laughs> crazy, bro. Like, who just does that? Like, yeah. <laughs> Michael Jordan. That's who does that. 
No, I'm, I'm excited for the rest. This this is like my only entertainment or live entertainment at the moment. So I'm excited to keep watching it. He's yeah, wild. it should be fun. To it. But uh, anybody got any closing thoughts? Anything that we didn't touch on? No? Appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, man. Yeah, appreciate I'm you coming on, you. man. I'm, I'm excited to see how you do in the season. You know, hopefully the season starts at a normal time and all that. And everything goes according to plan. Yeah, sure. um, yeah, man. Hope you hope you enjoy your time with the Steelers, man. We hope to see some highlights. I'll be getting that Kenoy jersey. Uh, I'm excited, man. <laughs> yeah. Once again, though, congrats, man. I, I think one of the things me and Vince have been talking about is how we don't really give people props in the moment. We kind of wait until things have passed, or like in Kobe's case, until they pass. So, don't want to say it to you now. Like, congrats that you you know you accomplished the dream, man. It's it's crazy. Appreciate you, it, man. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, yeah. So, we're definitely pulled to a game, bro. When when all this is done, we'll make a road trip. <laughs> we'll make a road trip. Sounds Whatever good. Team you're part of, we'll pull up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, everybody listening, make sure you check out the description. All John's socials will be down there. Support him and all that. And uh, yeah, man, appreciate you coming on again. I appreciate you. Man. Appreciate you. All right. Catch y'all later. <laughs>